Well, let's just pray. Grab a hand with some with the person next to you. And Father, we thank you for what you're doing. In the name of Jesus, we release just your insight and wisdom tonight. Amen. I want to talk to you about uh, a subject that Bill just um, he, he touched on uh, some this morning, and I've heard, heard him share uh, on the subject many, many times in the past. But I want to talk about a city under the influence of the kingdom. And I want to pick up in um, Luke chapter 13, and I've been doing this um, series on prophets. How many of you got to be a part of any of that? You know, I'm going to connect that, I think at least, I don't know if I'm going to have time, but I'm going to connect that. It says I have 22 seconds left. What does that? <laughs> oh, it's counting up. Uh, oh, I see. It's adding time. Dude, this is a prophetic act right here. <laughs> I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. Someone needs to write a song about that. So I, I want to connect. I, I hope to get some time to connect um, what... Uh, some of the prophetic teaching to this, to this uh, teaching that I'm going to share tonight. But um, I, I have been really, really um, thinking a lot about, um, all of us have actually on, on our team, and probably it's been in your heart too. Um, I've been thinking about our city. What, what does it look like when the kingdom comes? And I had a, a, a strong conversation, uh, a good conversation, um, with, a, with some, a leader in our city uh, in, in the last few weeks, and we were, we were, we were having this conversation. Uh, he's not a believer, and, was, and uh, it was just a really great, respectful conversation. He was sharing his dream. Um, I was just asking him, you know, what is your, what's your vision for our city? And he was sharing some things that he, that he had on his heart for, for our city, just really good stuff. And, and, um, and he said, you know what, he started, <laughs> after about an hour, um, talking together, he said, um, can I ask you a question? I've wanted to ask this question. He said, I've actually asked about a hundred of your leaders this question. I said, sure, whatever. And he said, um, what is Bethel? <laughs> like, what is Bethel about? You know, why are all these people coming? And what is Bethel about? And what are you guys, and, and, and it was related, and I have to tell you that the context was about our city, so he wasn't saying, like, he knows Bethel's a church, and he's, um, he's met several of our leaders, and he's friends with lots of our leaders, so he wasn't saying, you know, what's, is Bethel a church? He's not, he's not saying that. He was, in, in reference to the context of our city, he's saying, what, <laughs> Bethel's doing all this stuff, but we can't. Nobody could kind of figure out what what is Bethel like. Are you like are you political activists or you, you know are you like what what are you what are you trying to do here? And uh, and he shared that he had been here a long time and that he that he had quite a bit of anxiety over even though he he liked literally he's probably he probably knows personally like thirty or forty of our leaders. He, he carries, and he said this after, he said, I carry a lot of anxiety. I've carried a lot of anxiety over what, what you guys might be and what you aren't and what you are. And so I, I started to share some stuff with him, and um, I, I shared for about probably just 10 minutes. And he looked at me and he said, you have disarmed 33 years of anxiety of living in the city by what you just shared with me. And he said, everybody needs to hear what you, guys, what you guys think you're doing and who you guys are to their city. So I have to tell you that before I share this, that I have not talked about this to, I, I, I shared a little text to Bill, but so this, I'm going to share this is my opinion because in fairness, in fairness, I have not sat down with our senior team and worked through all this. this and, so, and, um, and I know that there's some people aren't going to like what I have to say. So I will um, say, this is Chris's opinion. That, that's not uncommon for me to say, is it? This is Chris's opinion. And then the stuff that I think you're going to be really mad about, I'll say, the Lord told me this. That's what prophets get to do. But before that, if you'll turn to Luke chapter 13, I, I want to give you just a little context for what I'm about to say. And, and this is... 
these verses were very popular. Uh, Bill shared out of, uh, out of these verses and, and this context many times in Weaverville. So this is not, the, this concept um, is not at all, the part, this part of the concept that I'm gonna share with you is, is not new to, to us, to, to, to Bethel, to Mount Chapel, to our family. Um, and this is Jesus speaking about the kingdom of heaven. And, and actually, I think this is, a, uh, I, don't, I, don't, um, I think it's about the third parable in a series of, of parables that Jesus is talking about. What, what should I compare the kingdom to? And in verse 18, he says this. So he was saying, what is the kingdom of God like? And to what shall I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed which a man took and threw in his garden and it grew up and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. Verse 20 is the verse I really want to connect to. And again he said, and what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. It's like leaven in which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour and it was, until it was all leavened. Now, I don't know a thing about cooking baking or any of that kind of stuff. I'm actually not allowed in the kitchen. <laughs> my kids were little and my wife would go on retreat. I remember she went on retreat two times and both times my kids were, were little. And I remember Jason, he was probably four. As soon as Kathy walked out the door, she, he said, this is his first words out of, out of his mouth, what are we going to eat? <laughs> Seriously, I'm, that was, that's a true story. So I, I have no reputation for knowing anything about baking, cooking, and, uh, but I can cook soup, dude, and I am a master chef at the microwave. <laughs> Seriously, if you can microwave it, I, don't put eggs in there. <laughs> yeah, and don't dry your cat in there, because that'll, that'll, that's really, yeah, not good. Tastes like chicken, though. Anyway, uh, <laughs> making friends right away. Okay, let's go on. It's like leaven, which a woman took and, hit, and hid in three pecks, pecks of flour until it was all leavened. And this is, this is about, probably for those of you that do bake, and my wife bakes, it's, it's about taking leaven, putting it in dough, as you know, and it makes the bread rise. And so, and, and Jesus is comparing the kingdom. What shall I compare the kingdom to? And he says this, he shares this parable, and he said, listen, and he shares several parables, so he's kind of giving you, well, it's like this, and, it, and it's like this, and it's like this over here. It's like a mustard seed, a little tiny seed, but when you put it in the garden, it becomes one of the biggest plants in the garden, and it's like, and it's old. It's also like, it's like when a woman's baking, and she puts a little bit of leaven in a whole bunch of flour, and it makes the whole loaf rise. It's like that, and, um, and, and so, you know, we... We look at that and I'm like, okay, what, what exactly does that mean? And one of the things that, that I, I see in there is two things. One is Jesus is talking about a certain, a, a certain, if you will, aspect of the kingdom. And by the way, that's why I mentioned there's ser several parables about the kingdom. How many understand it's pretty hard to explain the kingdom in one parable? How many know that the kingdom has more dimensions than, than you can explain in one line, one paragraph, or with one analogy? And so, you know, oftentimes with the body of Christ, you know, we're, we're sons of God and we're the bride of Christ. The kingdom's like an army and the kingdom is like a body and the kingdom is like a garden and the kingdom is, how many of you understand that those, those are different analogies that, they, that, that when you put them all together, you're supposed to get a picture of the kingdom. One analogy doesn't fit the whole king, the whole kingdom, or does it nor does it represent the whole king, represent the whole kingly uh, God's, God's uh, idea of the kingdom. And so tonight I want to just talk about uh, maybe, just, maybe it's just one aspect of the kingdom. But, he said, but, she, uh, but, but Jesus said it's like, it's like leaven which a woman took. It's interesting that it's a woman. That a woman in, uh, by the way, women didn't have any value in the days that Jesus walked the earth. So it's interesting that he is saying the kingdom is like women get involved too in the kingdom. They get involved in the kingdom, and by the way, they make the whole kingdom rise. Just like leaven, they make the kingdom rise. And by the way, Jesus did not do that by accident. If you, read, if you understand the days that Jesus walked the earth, that was in your face, anti, you know, uh, what do you call it, counterculture statement, that a woman was actually part of the kingdom and that she was making the kingdom rise. 
So, I, yes, come on, ladies, just give it to me right here. But this part, uh, uh, this part of the kingdom, I, I love this, this aspect of the kingdom. Part of the kingdom is hidden. Part of the kingdom is, is not o- o- overt, but covert. And I love what Chris uh, was sharing earlier, and it's just Chris. It's, it's classic Chris Overstreet. I, I, don't, I don't know what you do with Chris Overstreet. You just like wind him up and let him go, and it's like, I don't know, Jesus on steroids or something. <laughs> Boldness on steroids for sure. And so there's, there's a part of the kingdom that's, that's, that's overt, and, and we, we talk about that, and I, I don't think, you know, we, I don't think anybody would think Bethel's, our Bethel Church, nobody would describe Bethel Church as Christians in a closet. <laughs> nobody. So, so this message, you, you don't have to worry, we're, we're not going in the closet. But I want to talk to you about an aspect of the kingdom that maybe people wouldn't get. And that is this part. The kingdom is like leaven that's hidden, uh, in, that's hidden in flour and it makes everything rise. And I'd like to share with you, like, you know, we have, um, obviously, we have, we have thousands of people that come to this church. I have no idea what the real number is. It's, uh, there's 2,000 students, just, just students plus their families. I don't know, we have like 800 children in children's church on any given Sunday. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know how many thousands of people come to Bethel Church on any given Sunday. There's probably five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people that call Bethel home. And there's 89 to 93,000 people in our community. Have you noticed the way that we've chosen to influence our community? It's called serving generosity, giving, and finding people to love and giving them what it is they think they need. And so um, I, um, I, I shared uh, a couple of things with him. First of all, I, I want to read you something I, I, I uh, wrote on Facebook um, because I think it might uh, more quickly say what I'm trying to say. I personally have no interest in Redding, California becoming the Christian equivalent of Mormon Utah. <laughs> I, I said, this is Chris's opinion. Don't get me wrong, I would love everyone in Redding to know Jesus, but my goal is for the kingdom to be extended into our city in such a way that it benefits believers and unbelievers alike. What I mean is that I want to see believers serve our city without an agenda except to love people in felt ways. I hate the concept that I'm obligated to get people to pray a prayer or, or, um, or that the reason I serve someone is to get them to go to church. I would hope that someone, I would hope that the fruit of people watching my life would be that they get hungry for God and get to know him, but it's not my goal. When we make leading everyone to Christ our goal, we have an agenda and it feels like we're car salesmen with a fake interest in people so we can sell them Jesus. I don't want people to be my project or my business. I want the kingdom to come in in every realm of life so that it reigns on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, it benefits everyone no matter their spiritual condition or their conviction. If unbelievers discover the goodness of God as the fruit of our true love for them, that's great. If they have no interest in Jesus or are opposed to him, it shouldn't affect our ability to love or serve them. So I'm not looking for Christians to take over our city. Constantine tried that in Rome, and it was a failed experiment. By the way, isn't it interesting that people often say that, that, that Rome failed because of immorality? But actually, the, Rome split into two different, as you know, two different nations, and the nation that died first was the nation that became a Christian nation. When Constantine Christianized his, his nation and made it illegal to not be a Christian, 150 years later, Rome fell, not because of immorality, but because of religion. Just a thought. You might have one. So I'm not looking for Christians to take over our city. Constantine tried that in Rome, and it was a failed experiment. Why can't we just love people the way that Daniel loved Nebuchadnezzar and be released from selling Jesus? In the end, the king met God. 
What an awesome fruit. But it wasn't Daniel's goal to lead his king to God. We just, he just served him in such a way that it opened Nebuchadnezzar's heart to experience God. Now, before, before you, like, you know, leave, <laughs> I already know what, you're gonna, what some people are thinking because I got like 250, you know, comments. Um, but when I, when I, I, you know, we, we were in business for 20 years and we owned nine businesses and started seven from scratch. And um, follow my analogy, I, I never got in business so I can make money. How many of you understand it's pretty hard to be successful if you don't make money? But my goal wasn't to make money, it was to serve people. So I had goals on how we were going to serve people. And in serving people, the fruit of serving people was that we made money. But I didn't want to make the goal of my, of my business make money and then the people serve my goal. I wanted to serve the people and have the fruit of serving people profit. Are you with me? And I always looked at it like, if we weren't making enough profit, we probably weren't serving well enough, or maybe there was new ways to serve people. And by the way, I am totally not against profit or money. You know, if, you, if you're a millionaire, a billionaire, it doesn't bother to me as long as, you own, as long as you own the money and it doesn't own you. As long as the money, doesn't, the money serves you, but you don't serve the money. As long as you own the house, but the house doesn't own you. As long as you own the business, but the business doesn't own you. And I use this analogy because I, I, you know, we, I teach often in business, and I, I think that especially young business people, they get in business and they're like, I'm going to make a lot of money. And I, God bless you, I hope that you do make a lot of money. But, but I think there's a difference between a Christian business and a kingdom business. In a Christian business, I, it, and I don't think there should be, but I, I just think there is. I see, I see business people who are Christians go into business and their goal is to make a lot of money. And I talk to them, they're like, my goal is to make a million dollars in the next 10 years. Awesome. What's your goal? My goal is to serve people so well, to do something in, in such an extraordinary way. Jesus said it this way. He said, do your works in such a way that people see your good works and they glorify your Father who's in heaven. My, my, I sold auto parts. Like, there isn't very many creative ways, you know, like, you know, the guy down the street sells auto parts, you know, there's, there's nothing, you know, I don't know if this is the right, how to say this, but there's nothing sexy about auto parts. <laughs> Probably should, thought, I was trying to think of another way to say it, but, you, you know, there's, there's like, you know, you sell auto parts, you know, how do you get people like, hey, come buy auto parts at our store, you know, it's just, it's just nothing. You know, I, I look at the Carl's Jr. You know, hamburger with the beautiful girl eating it. I'm like, she don't eat those burgers. I don't want to disappoint any of you, but she don't eat those burgers. <laughs> Benny can tell you that. She don't eat those burgers. Um, people do all kinds of crazy stuff to like, get you to buy their stuff. And I'm like, you know, if people are that stupid, you can buy burgers there. You know, I mean, I'm not saying Carl's Jr. I'm just saying whatever. <laughs> You know, you, you drive that car, you're not going to get that girl. I, I'm sorry, you're just not. You know, that, that girl doesn't go with the car, whatever. You know, you know what I'm saying? You, you, you can wear that, but you're not going to look as good as that model who took eight hours to, you know, and, you know, and who, photo, who got photoshopped and airbrushed after they were done with her. You know what I'm saying? You're not going to look like that. So, so my goal is, my goal has always been, how do I serve, how do I do something ordinary? Like, auto parts is ordinary. How do I do it in a way that is, the way I do it is so extraordinary, they go, that's got to be God. Yeah. Yeah. That guy seems to care about me. He doesn't seem just to want my money. I remember just simple things, and I, you know, these are just simple stories, but, you know, people would come to the counter with all the stuff they want to buy to fix their car. And, and, uh, and uh, our guys would do the same. And I would say, why are you buying that and that and that? And they're saying, well, because I have this problem. I'd say, you don't need all that. I put all that back. Just buy this. And they're saying, I should just buy it. I'm like, that's your problem. Just buy that. That's all you need. You don't need $150 worth of parts. You just need this. Are you sure? 98% of the time, that's what's wrong. And by the way, that other stuff's not returnable. It's all electrical parts. So you don't want to buy that stuff. And worst case scenario, you buy this and then come back and get something else. But don't buy all that stuff. It's a waste of money. And the fact that people felt like they were people and not a number. 
See, I, I, I want you to know, like, I, you know, I was lost. I, 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 did, I grew up in a family that didn't know Jesus. When I met Jesus, my, my whole, you know, my, I came alive. I, I want, I have a passion for people to know Jesus. I do, I do. I also hate being manipulated. I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want the, you know, I'm going to be nice to you because, so I can lead you to Christ. I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know what you think about that. I think that's, sucks. <laughs> I'm trying to do my best. To, I, I, I think that it, my, I think it feels, I think it feels like I stepped on, I step, you know, I, I go to buy a car, and by the way, you know, I, I work with car salesmen, and there's, there's lots and lots of good ones. There's great car dealerships here, by the way. We buy my, almost all of our cars here in town, and there's great dealerships. But I, I'm talking about the typical, you know, stereotypical car salesman who comes up to you, and, you know, you walk on, onto the lot, and they're like, oh, I love your shirt. You know, oh, where'd you buy those pants? And, I, and I'm thinking, you, you could give a rip about my shirt, and you can give a rip about my pants. Can we not, like, can we not do plastic, and can we not pretend? Like, if I didn't walk on this lot, you would give a rip about me. You know, and I'm not saying everybody, I'm just saying most people. And I, and I hate it, I hate the fakeness. I don't, I don't want to be, I, I just want, listen, you're, you're here to sell cars, I'm here to buy one, so let's just, can we just keep it real? Can we not, can you not pretend like you have to like me because you need to sell a car. I don't like that. And so what would happen, what would happen if you just actually loved people? Yeah. No, I mean, it's a whole new concept, like you just actually did. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, you did because you just did. Yeah. Uh, uh, all of us that have children know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, I have a plan for my kids, you know? Like, I want them to be successful, I want them to serve God, I want them to love God, I want all of that. But you know what? You know why I love them? I, if you do, would you tell me? Because I have no idea. Like, I just love them. When they came out, I just love them. <laughs> you know, I say, I, I can't say I love you because you're a great basketball player. I love you because you're beautiful. Because the truth is, if you were ugly, I'd still love you. <laughs> if you were a drug addict, I would still love you. If you acted like a complete idiot, I have no idea why. Listen, this is supernatural. I would still love you. Now, if you weren't my kid, I can't say that. It's true. I'm just being real. Like, I struggle. Like, Dan says he's never met someone he didn't love. I, I can't say that's true. I, I, I'd say, you know, one of these days I want to be like Dan. I'm following Dan so that I can be like that someday. But if I, there, there's something inside of me, there's something inherent in loving your children that tells you how God loves you. Like, I, I, do, I do want them to do well, but I don't love them so they will. Like, it's so non-manipulative. Like, I don't love them so they will. I just love them. And there's something so freeing in leading people to Christ because they, you actually love them instead of because you're under some compulsion. Like, if I don't do it any second, they're... You know, it's like, I understand there's another side of the story. Chris can come up and preach that. Next Sunday, you can come and preach. Because I, I love truth and tension. And I think that all truth lies in tension. And I realize that this message needs tension. And we had it when Chris came up. Because I, I do believe that, you know, uh, there's, there is a reality that people that don't know Christ are going to hell. And how can you not be compelled to lead people to Christ who are, who are going to hell? I understand that. On, on the other side of that is that, that um, when you make people your project instead of your love, it, they know it. They can feel it. And so I love bold love, and, and, I, and I love when the Holy Spirit is leading us, and I have no problem, you know, I, I, I would say, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have much fear of people, so I, it's not... It wouldn't be hard for me to stand up in a play and say, who doesn't know Jesus? I can tell you, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I wouldn't have a little anxiety, but it, 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 I wouldn't keep me from doing it. I, I do fear people, but most of the people I fear, one's at home tonight and the other's sitting in the front row. I mean, <laughs> not pretty much it. <laughs> Bill could tell you that's pretty true. You know, it's like, I, I don't have a lot of fear of people, which is a problem. <laughs> 
can be a problem. I was in a plane not too long ago, and a person was acting like a complete idiot to the stewardess. He was like six rows up, and I just stood up, and I said, can you just be quiet and sit down? And Kathy looked over at me like, I'm not sure that was your role to say that. At least I didn't say in Jesus' name. I didn't want him to know I was a Christian at the time. I have been known for people sitting in my row being rude to the stewardess to say, that was really rude. Is there any reason why you're treating her like that? And my wife saw. Please don't tell her you're a pastor. I'm not. I'm a prophet. I get to do this. Please, that was a joke. That's nothing to do with any office. It just has to do with just, you know. So, so, so I live in this tension. Of, I, I want everyone to find Jesus. I, if, you're, if, you, if, you heard, if you knew me, then you, this wouldn't even be a question. But I'm all, all, obviously, we're speaking to lots and lots of people who don't know us from the podium. And so you would know that. In the midst of that, I, I, I want... To, I want to honor people where they're at, and I, and I actually believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world and not me. And that I need to actually to be led by the Spirit because it, what I can do in my zeal is actually push people away who, who have a little bit of hunger for God, and I, uh, you know, I dump the whole gospel on them, and they're like, dude, I don't want any more, anything else to do with you. And so, um, so I, I, I believe in boldness. I also believe in wisdom. And I believe in being led by the Spirit. And, I, and, I, and I, think that, I think that we would lead a lot more people to Christ if they just saw that we actually love them. And I remember um, some years ago, I'll, I'll be careful because we're streaming, and I, I can hear my wife in my head right now. <laughs> we made these new friends. Uh, I was working at this place, and this guy worked there. And, and he said, hey, we're, we're having some friends over, and, and we'd really love to have you come over. You know, we really admire you, and da-da-da. And I'm like, oh, that's cool, you know. And I mean, we were, like, married a year. So Kathy and I go over to this really beautiful house. It was, you know, it was probably a million-dollar house. It was, and there were was, there was several people gathered, just like a home group. I'm like, oh, this is cool, you know. And they said, yeah, we're having some friends over. And so, you know, so we, you know, they, we, we ate and stuff. And then, and then it, um, after we ate... They said, oh, let's gather around, and you know, I thought we were going to gather around and play some games, and, and then it turned out it was a, a certain multi-level marketing meeting. Three times I've been invited to that, those marketing meetings over 15 years, same company, every time I'm invited to my friend's house to find out that actually has nothing to do with being a friend. It has to do with buying a product or selling it to people. And all three times I've walked out feeling con completely manipulated. That wasn't real. You tricked me. And if I would have signed up out of, you know, some people, you know, they don't do confrontation. And so they pray a prayer with you, but nothing happens. And as Chris said, you know, the other day, there's, there's no magic in the prayer. It's all about heart. And so there's a lot of people, you know, that are walking around that have prayed a prayer because they don't know how to say no. You know, they don't, ha they don't know how to say no. You know, some of us don't have too much trouble saying no, but, you know, they don't, they don't know how to say no, and they don't want to embarrass you, and they're like, okay, I'll pray the prayer with you, and you walk, I led five people to Christ, and I'm like, them, some of those people got just enough of Jesus to be inoculated from the real thing. And by the way, nobody prayed a prayer in the Bible to receive Christ. Show me one place where anybody prayed a prayer to receive Christ. I'd propose to you they got baptized as a sign of following Christ. And by the way, they didn't convert people to Christianity. They had followers of Jesus. And the way you knew that they were following Jesus is that they were following. It's a very interesting concept. They're like, Jesus following. So, so anyway, I, I know where I'm trying to go. And I, I do feel some anxiety up here for obvious reasons. But, but the, the, the concept that I, I pray for somebody to get, you know, Philip is, is a great example. He's with the eunuch, and, and, he's, and the eunuch is hungry for God because he's reading the Bible. And, you know, and Philip goes, hey, do you understand what you're reading? This is the only named evangelist in the Bible, by the way. And he goes, no. He goes, well, let me just take you through it. And he says, and he took him through the scriptures. We don't know what he said to him, but we do know this. 
When they got close to water, he said, is that enough water for me to be baptized in? He didn't say, can I pray a prayer? So we know that the early church, baptism had something to do with acknowledging that you were following Christ. I understand that on a plane it's a little hard, like, you know, let's go back in the toilet, you flush, I'll put you in there. <laughs> Guy comes out with blue hair, you're like, you're a Christian. You know, I don't know. This isn't going so well. I had something completely different pictured in my head. You know, I guess this has been debated for, for, you know, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of years. You know, what does it look like when the kingdom comes in our city? And, and, I, and I think, does it mean like we, you know, we develop a Bethel political group and we take every seat in city council and every seat in, in, you know, in, the, in, the, in the school system and you know, and we, you know, we, and we, like, we just take over our city. When you come to our city, we have all the political power, and we have so many people. We have so many students that you know, we just fill every city council meeting. Uh, you know, to, when, you know, there's only 200 seats there, and we tell our students, "Hey, we're a city council meeting, and we're gonna, we want to pass this thing. Fill the place up. You know what? Just don't let anybody else get there early, by the way. And it's part of your class, so you know, you, we'll check in at the door. You know." I and mean, it's like, you know, we could literally do that. I don't know if you know this, but just to share, you, share with you some of our heart, when we, when, we wanted to, um, when we wanted to take the Civic over, and by the way, that was, that, was, that, that was for the city. The city was losing the Civic Auditorium. We, needed, we did need a place to grow our school, but, the, you know, let me just, I'll just tell you this. The school pays just to, just to the Civic, three $750,000, three quarters of a million dollars rent, four times what that place is worth. And why do we do that? Because we want to see, the, we want to serve our city. We want to see the Civic open. And then we only have it for 10 months a year. So figure that out. That's $72,000 a month. And then we only have it half days, four days. Figure out how much that is an hour. And tell me that we're doing it just for the school. Could go rent a building very easily for that. So when we, we developed a plan to, to take the, the Civic Auditorium, to lease the Civic Auditorium from the city to help the city so we wouldn't lose that because here we are trying to gain ground in our city, help our city to be a destination, a place where people come to, to, to experience the kingdom and every aspect of the kingdom. And we, you know, and we don't want to go backwards. We don't want to lose things we have. And so we just began to think about ways to, um, to how can we help our city? We just, we ask all the time, how can we help our city? Eric and I had a conversation again this week. How can we help our city? Like, what are the felt needs of our city? Without an agenda, without a, hey, you know what? If we help you, will you close the abortion clinic? If we help you, will you? It's like, no, no agenda. So we get to, um, we have to go to city council and, and there is a quite a, up, you know, we have cheerleaders cheering against us. And, and, and in the city council uh, room holds about 200 people, about. And um, we said to all of our people, and so we have to go to city council to get this plan approved to take over the civic auditorium. And there's, uh, there's about 10 other groups trying to take the building over also. Um, and so we go to the city council meeting, but we ask all of our people, Please, nobody come. We don't want you to come. Don't, we don't want any Bethel people at the city council meeting because we trust that God has put the city council members in there. Uh, the, we honor them as ministers of God. And we pray for wisdom for them, and we pray that they'll know the right thing to do. And if this is the right thing to do, then we trust that God will, will turn their hearts. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And like water, he turns it whatever way he, which, he wishes. So what we don't want to do, and we said to our people, what we don't want to do is apply political pressure like, it's going to cost you your, your career if you don't give us the civic. So consequently, none of our people showed up except for four of us who were giving a presentation, and all of them showed up. And it was... Um, it was, pretty, it was a pretty fun day. 
32 of them spoke before us. And, um, and probably 25 of them um, spoke against us, and the rest had their own plan. And ultimately, we just, you know, Charlie and I and, and the team, Sherry, I think, and there was somebody else there, Julie Winters, we just sat back and we listened, and we just said, and, and my presentation, I just started the presentation, and I said, if this isn't the best plan, please feel free to choose whatever plan you think is the best plan. Because all we want to do is help our city. And we developed a PowerPoint and a plan, and when we got all done, they said, no one else seems to have a plan, everyone else just seems to have an opinion. This, if anyone else has a plan, please share it, because what we've heard is 30, 31, 32 opinions, but we've heard no plan. And consequently, we ended up with the Civic. What I'm getting at is this. We didn't apply political pressure to them. We just said, we're here to serve you. We think we have a great plan. If you don't think this is a great plan, give it to somebody else. But please don't let it close, because that's not good for our city. Am I making any sense to you? And so, you know, we have, we have worked, when I say we've worked hard, uh, we've, we've worked hard to build trust with our city because Christians are typically, they, they, they serve their city typically for an agenda, with an agenda, I mean. So typically they're like looking for something, they want something there. You know, it's like, do this, do that, and let's, you know, let's, um, let's, let's, let's use our force to change people from the outside in. And we're like, let's use our influence to help people see the kingdom from the inside out so they see how good the king is and they want the king. When I was young, Mario Marilla was one of my very favorite preachers and he said one time, you know, if you have, if you have something so amazing, you don't have to shove it down people's throat, they will steal it. Sometimes I'm concerned that we don't know that our product is the best. Sometimes I think we think there's even a close second. And I wonder if, if we just demonstrated the goodness of a, of a loving king in our own life and in our families. I wonder how many people would want our king if they just knew how much he loved them. In fact, God had an evangelistic plan in the Old Testament. He said to Israel, I'm going to treat you so awesome, the nations around are going to go, wow, that's amazing. Who, what God do you serve? Okay, we'll serve him. And it was called, his, his, his evangelistic plan was called jealousy. No, look it up. It's called the jealous evangelistic plan. God goes, I'm going to bless you, and the ends of the earth will know it, and they'll come running, and they'll come say, and they'll come say hey, uh, teach us the ways of the Lord. It doesn't say, you'll go and shove it down their throat. It says, you'll rise and shine, and they'll come. Um, let me tell you what that requires. It requires you to actually have a successful marriage and not just talk about one. This is deep. People doing seminars on marriage don't even have marriage sometimes. Anyway, that's just my opinion. <laughs> um, I, I like the idea of I like the idea of being hidden in a way. Well, let me say this. I would never hide because I'm afraid. Me, personally. It's not my personality type. I understand that, that God makes all kinds of different people, and I value the people in this room like, you know, you're shy, and you know, the speaking to other people is, is tough, and I have areas of my life that you know, freak me out, too. So I'm not like, oh, I got it all together. I don't. But talking to people is not a problem about pretty much anything. I mean, I talk about sex from up here. I mean, it's not a problem. People like, ah, they cover their heads with their Bible, and I'm still talking. I'm like, having a good time. Not a problem at all. <laughs> so, so, so when I tell you, like, you know, like I, I, like, I like, I like just serving people and loving people, and then when they go, you know, well, how come you're so successful? I say, well, 
I said, actually, now they go, are, are you a Christian? I go, no, I'm a follower of Jesus. <laughs> it's just, I've just been doing that lately. Because sometimes Christian and follower of Jesus some, used to be, you know, they used to be synonymous, and I'm not sure they are anymore. So, anyway. Um, I had this uh, prophetic word uh, a while back I shared here. Um, and and it, I think it kind of typifies what I'm trying to say tonight. And that is, you know, I, uh, in fact, let me read to you this part of the word. Um, it's about Rolls Royce. Rolls Royce was founded in 1906 by Henry Rolls and Charles Royce. Uh, I'm sorry, Henry, uh, Henry Royce and Charles Rolls. And Rolls Royce began as an aircraft engine manufacturing company. And Rolls Royce was powered about half the planes flown by the Allies, and now Rolls Royce builds cars. Now, um, the, the reason I'm sharing that with you is I, I had this encounter with the Lord. This part is a prophetic word. This part, uh, you, it needs to be judged, but it, it isn't my opinion. It is a word that I felt the Lord gave me uh, a few months ago. I felt like the Lord um, uh, said, in fact, he, he, he gave me a vision, and, and in the vision I saw um, I, I saw Rolls Royce and I saw these engines being put in power plants and in cars and in boats and in, you, you know, in planes and in ships, and, which they are now. And, and I felt like the Lord, and, and, I, and I saw this, this vision, in fact, let me read it to you. I had this vision of mothers and fathers, uh, uh, politicians and policemen, pastors and prophets, educators and doctors, scientists and inventors, artists and actors, all seated into the very fabric of society and written over all of their hearts was powered by Bethel. Metaphorically speaking, we, are, we, never, build, uh, we never build politicians, nurses, engineers, ex- the scientists, but we build the engines that propel them. Come on. And I had, this, I had this dream, I had this vision, it was in a dream, I had this vision that we were building engines that people were putting in all kinds of different chassis. That we were building power plants for the, for, for, uh, to, to make electricity for cities. And we were building engines for cars. And we were, and we were building engines for planes and for, for boats and for electronic plants and all these different things. And every one of them had this little this symbol on it that said Rolls Royce. And I, I, and I felt like the Lord said, I, uh, and this is to be judged. I felt like the Lord said, you're not the, you don't build cars. You don't build planes. I don't want you to build. I don't want you to build ships. I don't want you to build. I don't want you to build. I don't want you to build these things. I want you to build engines, and th- they will take that engine and they will put it in every area of society. And obviously, we know this isn't about Bethel. This is about the king and the kingdom. This is about politicians will come here and they will get the kingdom. They will get to king. Maybe some of them will become politicians. Some of them will already be politicians. And they come here and they're looking for, they have the chassis. They have the vision. They have everything they need. They just need the engine. You you know, like you look, most of our computers, you know, you look it up and it says, you know, powered by Intel. You know, I don't know if Intel builds a computer. Maybe they do. I don't know. But let's just say they don't. It's like you open your computer up, powered by Intel. It's like Intel's everywhere. It's in every computer. And it's like, I just have this, I have this sense. It's like that we, what we're called, I'm not saying the whole body is. I'm trying to say this is our DNA. I love what um, Peter McHugh said. He said, when, uh, let me just read it to you. He's, it's a better quote than I can think of. I guess I won't find it. He said, when I get to heaven, yeah, I won't, I won't find it, but he said, he was talking about himself. His name's Peter McHugh. He said, when I get to heaven, God's not going to say, why were you not Moses? Wow. He's going to say, why were you not Peter? Why were you not Peter McHugh? Why did you not become fully Peter? And what I'm getting at is that everybody, like, I, I think that, that it takes all kinds of different metaphors to display what the kingdom of God, what the kingdom of heaven is like, what the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like this, and it's like this, and it's like this, and it's like this, and it's like this. And I think different parts of the body demonstrate different parts of the kingdom. And I think there are people that are, that are, that are, you know, that are overtly, um, that are called to be overt protesters of righteousness. John the Baptist is a great example. 
And I think there's other people that are, they're needed in society. And if you will, they're hidden in the dough of society. And in the dough of society, all of society rises. Why? Because behind the scenes, and behind where nobody knows, behind the scenes, everybody knows Pharaoh, everybody knows, everybody knows Nebuchadnezzar, but behind the scenes is a Daniel. Behind the scenes is a Joseph. And, and if you look at the, the, especially the book of Daniel, we have so much more about Daniel in, in his life, his, per, his private life with the king. You never see Daniel, uh, at least in the book, you don't see Daniel trying to introduce him to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, to the fourth chapter of Daniel, when Daniel's already served the king for many years, the king calls him Daniel, the son of the gods, plural. He thinks Daniel is a polytheist. He served him several years, and he still doesn't know that Daniel only serves one God. And yet, guess what happens? He loves Daniel's gift. And when the king has a dream that troubles him, he says, oh, Daniel, whom is the spirit of the gods? And then Daniel says, listen, let me tell you something. I serve a God not God's, who knows the secrets of men's hearts. And let me tell you the meaning of the vision, the meaning of the dream. And he begins to tell Nebuchadnezzar about his first dream. And you know, the first dream, the king's going to kill everybody if he doesn't, if he doesn't, if some, if one of his wise men don't tell him the dream and the meaning of the dream. And the second dream, he has this another, another dream about this tree and the, and the tree gets cut down. And it's just a stump. Do you remember that? And for seven seasons, whatever that means, for seven, for, for, for seven seasons, the tree is, 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 you know, fruitless. It's just a stump. And then suddenly God restores it. And, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is the one having the dreams. It's not Daniel. Mm, let's see if I can get, get you to understand where I'm going. This is the old covenant, Right? We live in a new covenant where it rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. In the old covenant, it didn't even rain on the unrighteous. The unrighteous were were enemies. I mean, we celebrate David and Goliath. You realize David and Goliath is about a story. We teach this in Sunday school. It's, It's a story about David killing people who didn't love God. That's the old covenant. We teach our... Anyway... In that covenant, in that old covenant, when, when the king has a bad dream about himself and Daniel has to interpret the dream, Daniel is a POW. His family has been taken captive, probably maybe many of them killed. His country's been destroyed. His temple that he worshiped in has been torn down. And he's a POW in Babylon, in Babylon. And in the middle of that, he, the king has a dream about himself, and the dream is, for seven years, your mind's going to be taken away. Why? Because you're arrogant, and because you haven't, you haven't honored God. And when Daniel, when the king explains the dream to Daniel, Daniel says, the first thing Daniel says, I wish that this dream was about your enemies. And it wasn't about you. And the king said, tell me, listen, don't be afraid, tell me anyway. And Daniel interprets the dream in which the king loses his mind. And then he says to the king, even after all that, he goes, listen, maybe if you humble yourself, God will relent. And you know what happens? He, Nebuchadnezzar humbles himself for a year or so, but then he's standing on the top of his castle and he's like, I built all this, I'm awesome, don't I rock? And he loses his mind for seven seasons, whatever that means. And finally, he comes out of it, just as Daniel interpreted the dream. He comes out of the, out of the dream, I'm sorry, out of, the, out of this, you know, his state of mind, his complete insanity. The Lord gives him his mind back. And the first thing he does, Nebuchadnezzar, is he honors the God of heaven. Why did he do that? Because he met a man who loved him in spite of all of his crazy stuff, building statues to himself, making his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bow down to him, destroying his homeland, doing all that. But in spite of all that, he had a supernatural love for a king. And he served the king to his, he served the king for the king's benefit. 
And in doing so, he won a king, not through his words, but he took the experience, he, he invited the king into an experience with the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I don't think it's the only way, I just think it's one way. That we would become Daniels, that we would become Josephs, that we would be people needed into society so that whether you know God or love God or you don't want to know God and love God or love God, that we serve you. And so that we don't become the Mormon Utah. We become a place where we're known to love everyone. No matter, no matter their position on politics or on the kingdom. It doesn't mean we, we, we shouldn't tell them what we think. It's just that we should treat them with honor. Come on. We should honor them. I, I don't know if this is a new concept to some people. It didn't go well on Facebook. I, I think you'd be, I, I think, and I'm just, can I just talk to you from my heart for a minute? I, I just want to say this. I think that if people knew that I was not using this message to cover my fear of talking to people about Jesus, it would be easier for them. Because that, that's not a problem for me. So I think, I think sometimes people think, well, you're just trying to, like, you're, you're, you're a closet Christian, and you just don't want to let people know you're a Christian. I'm like, no, I have no problem at all telling people I'm a Christian, you know, letting people know I love Jesus. Uh, no, it's, if it's a king or a pauper, it matters not to me. But I really, really want us to serve our city just because. Just because we love them. Just because. I think it's a really cool strategy. Okay, you love me, what do you want? Nothing. I don't want anything. I think people are so used to being marketed. Yeah. They don't even know what to do when you just actually love them without an agenda. Uh, uh, they, it, like they still, like five years later, they're still trying to figure out now, now, now why are you doing this? Why are you helping us? I don't know, when we love you. Yeah, but yeah, I understand you love us, but why? When are you going to ask for the sale? And so I told this man, back to this conversation, I said, um, he said, so what's Bethel? I said, Bethel builds Rolls Royce engines. We, we, we develop kingdom mindsets that benefit people and we put them in all areas of society and we have no, we have, we have no desire to make this a Mormon Utah. If we wanted to do that, do you not think that we would have done it a long time ago? He said, I never thought of that, but I can tell you one thing, you just disarmed 33 years of anxiety. And he said, if people knew in our city, the people who didn't know God knew that you were actually serving the city because you love the city, it would dispel years of anxiety because people think you have another motive. He said, everybody, everybody I talk to loves you guys and doesn't trust you because nobody treats anyone this good without an agenda. That's what he said. That's what he said. Nobody treats anybody this good without an agenda. That's the king. Jesus had lots of followers and... Um, He's our model, is he not? Yes. And you know, this guy comes to him and says, hey, what do I have to do, you know? What, he doesn't use the word kingdom. What do, what do I have to do to be all right with God? He said, I don't know, what does the law say to you? He says, do this, 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 and this. He said, good, well do that, you'll be fine. The guy goes, wait a second, I did that. <laughs> I'm not satisfied. Like there's something missing in my life. I see it in you. Listen, I know I'm adding to it. But the connotation is, Jesus doesn't tell him like, hey, do this, do that, do this, do this, do this, do this, and you will, and he just goes, well, 
What's it say to you? What's the law say to you? You know the law? Yeah, what's it say to you? It says do this, 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 this. Okay, we'll do that and you'll be fine. The young man goes, I did all that and I'm not fine. He goes, well, if you want, if you want more, sell everything you have and follow me. He didn't start there. And the guy had a lot of money and he said, I, I gotta go home and think about that. <laughs> think I'll think about that. But my point is, you know, Jesus is preaching and he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood and people leave, I'm almost done. People start leaving. You don't think Jesus goes, wait, 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 time out. It's just a metaphor. It's just a metaphor. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, come back. Listen, I spent three years building this church. And he turns to the disciples, are you guys leaving? And I think it was Peter who says, where are we going to go? I think the connotation is sold everything, nowhere to go. <laughs> this is just my opinion, but I think Peter's probably thinking, hey, if you would have shared this message first, we wouldn't be here. You know, I'm just trying to listen. I'm just trying to contrast. I understand that there's, uh, there's, a, there's, that we, we normally preach the other side of this. But Jesus doesn't feel nervous about people following him. That's my point. He doesn't feel nervous. He doesn't feel like, I really, really need you guys. Don't leave, please. Oh, Father, I had so many and then I lost them. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if he had the Mon Monday morning blues. Oh, I wish I wouldn't have preached that message. I wish I wouldn't have used that. I wish I wouldn't have said sucks. You know, he, he wouldn't have said sucks, but in Hebrew, whatever that is. And, I'm a Greek or whatever. I wish he would, you know, I wish I wouldn't have done that, you know, like, like some of us preachers, like I do sometimes. I'm like, oh, I wish I would have did that, you know. I, I don't, Jesus doesn't, I, are you with me? Jesus doesn't seem nervous about getting people to follow him. He doesn't seem nervous about it. He doesn't seem like he's like, has a lot of anxiety about it. And he's hanging out with sinners and he's making friends with them. And you know, when they run out of wine, the sinners, he makes wine. I don't know, people are like, well, he didn't make wine, he made grape juice. Well, now the passage makes no sense. Most people serve the good grape juice first. I don't know how you fix that. I've never been grape juiced out. You know, it's like, well, you know, go over Bill's house like, man, this is some good grape juice. Oh, this is some really good grape juice. Why didn't you serve this first? No, the Greek word there is something like metros, and it means drunk. And, you know, Jesus made wine for people who were drunk. He's hanging out with sinners and making wine for people because his mother told him to, you know? This is like, this is just Jesus, you know? Just Jesus. And sometimes he's totally, he's totally, uh, you know, overt. Like he's turning over tables and he's, you know, you know, angry with people and he's saying, you're, you're, you know, you're messing with my father's house. You know, you've made my father's house a place of business. Stop it. And other times he's like, you know, people seem like, you know, he, he, you know, seem like they really want to follow him. And he's like, nah, nah, you know, just go back. I mean, the guy, that, the Gadarene man, you know, the Gadarene man, thousand demons, he gets delivered, he wants to follow Jesus. Jesus goes, no, no, go back home. We'd be like, oh, yeah, another member, member. you got to go to the membership class, fire starters, and, you know, I'm not against any of that. I'm simply saying, can, I, can you just hear my heart? I'm simply saying Jesus doesn't seem nervous. He seems like he's trusting the people, he trusts the Father to touch people and to bring them to a place. And I'd like to propose to you that we are one touch in people's life. Maybe two. Maybe, maybe we know these people. Maybe we have a relationship with them. But it's the, but it, it's the Father it's, it's, who's the Savior. Jesus is the Savior of the world. And so, you know, if you could just put that, you know, in, in, in you know, it, it, you know, put it, put it in, the, in with everything else you know. And if, you know, if you're sitting on a plane with someone and, and you feel compelled to tell them about Jesus, don't remember this message. <laughs> Just tell them about Jesus and pray a prayer with them and get them saved. And baptize in the Holy Spirit and healed. No, I'm serious. I am. I am I, I'll do it. I'm riding on a plane on Tuesday. If, if I'm sitting next to somebody and the Lord says, tell them about me, I will tell them about him. And I'll... I'm just trying to say that the, this kingdom, it can't be represented by one metaphor. Some of the kingdom is hidden and it makes all of society rise. And some of the kingdom is like a mustard seed 
that just gets big and goes, I'm over here. I'm over here. I'm bigger than all you guys. I'm totally overt. And some of the kingdom is totally covert. And it's all the kingdom. And okay, well, now what do I do? I'll be led by the Spirit, because when you get done with this message, you won't know what to do. <laughs> you won't know what to do. But I bet we all agree on this, even if you didn't like my message. We should love people no matter what. No matter what. They shouldn't feel like they're in a network marketing program when they come to your house. And I didn't use their name, so God bless them. Would you stand? I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> Only two people walked out. <laughs> hey, better than Jesus. He said, greater works than you'll do. I'm like, there it was right there. <laughs> Father, I didn't lose anyone except for the two that you predetermined. <laughs> and who knows how many people turned off iBethel TV and turned in the... <laughs> The front row's like. <laughs> Man, I would just really, I would just, what would happen if we were just compelled just to love our city? Yes. Listen, even if you're, listen, even if you don't agree with the message, you're like, I'm, you know, Jesus is, is telling me I'm, I need to tell everyone I meet about him. I'm like, that's awesome. Just, let's just make sure we really love people. That we really do, like that, that people aren't, if they're offended, they're offended, but they, they'll walk away knowing that you were compelled by love. That there was nothing else on your agenda except for you were compelled by love. Not by fear and not by bragging rights to your friends. You were just compelled by love. And so Jesus, we just pray right now that you would, you just fix this message. <laughs> Just make it what you want it to be, Lord, seriously. That you would need us into society. That we would make all of society rise. That we would arise and shine. That all of society, that Reading would become so loved by the King. That people from everywhere would come here to see what a city is like that's totally and completely loved by the king. From evil people to righteous people, that everyone is truly and completely loved by the king. And God, I pray that every single person, I pray that people that drive through our city, that they would feel like they drove drove through a love tunnel. Yeah, Highway 5, grace, the highway of grace. When they drive through our city, they'll be like, ah, I felt tickled. This place tickles me. Lord, I just pray, I pray for our city officials. I pray for those that you've put in power, they, it, whether they know you or they don't, our educational people and their teachers, everyone, that they, would, that they would know the love of God that is beyond comprehension in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. <laughs>